<laughs> I always try to bring in just great guests to help um, expand the conversation. And so today is definitely um, no difference. Today is also our last LinkedIn Live of the year. And uh, we are going to rest for December and we are going to come back at you hopefully in January <laughs> uh, if we're not too tired still. Um, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, we are going to start out with Miss Sharice Matheson. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharice Matheson, and I am the operations manager here at Smile Therapy Services, as long as well as a psychotherapist. And I'm so excited to talk about seasonal depression today and how we can navigate the ups and downs of this time. Thank you. Um, and then we have Michelle Williams. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Williams. I'm founder of Therapy to a T um, and longtime partner of Smile Therapy Services. And yeah, actually, seasonal depression is my jam, so I can't wait till we get into it. <laughs> yes. Um, and so both of these young ladies have extensive background in um, therapy um, and also just, you know, knowledge about seasonal depression. And so we are going to get into it with the questions. And so our first question is for the ladies, what is your definition of seasonal depression? So when you hear the word seasonal depression, how would you define it? And so e either one of you can, can get it started. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so seasonal depression is a type of depression that people experience in the transition between seasons, typically or most commonly from the fall to winter months. Um, and it is characterized by um, lower mood, lower energy, feelings of hopelessness, exhaustion. Um, yeah. Yes, and I would add to that and say it really kicks up once the time change happens and we have less daylight, um, as well as the drop in temperature, depend on where you're located in the country. Um, the significant temperature drops are also um, a marker of when you see those um, decreases in mood and energy um, that Michelle mentioned in her response. Perfect. Um, and so what will we say is the difference between seasonal depression and then regular depression? Um, because I definitely think that is a question that a lot of people have. So what would you say are the main differences um, between those two? Go ahead, Sharia. So I felt this crashing into each other. Um, well, so one, I would definitely start by saying one of the main differences is the correlation between what's happening um, seasonally. And then also that um, seasonal depression is a subset of clinical depression and that um, it very much differs in terms of the extent of time that it lasts for. Like that's the that's the number one um, separator. And then there are also separators too. like like Michelle said, like this is my really my jam to talk about because I experienced um, some seasonal depression symptoms myself. And so you also have like winter blues, um, which you wouldn't necessarily get diagnosed for having, you know, like the winter blues or you know, kind of that seasonal sadness. So it's really the time frame um, that you experience the symptoms and the onset um, differentiates depression. Um, and of course, we know there are so many different types of depression within, um, but the differentiation between that and seasonal depression. Perfect. Michelle, would you like to add anything? Nope, you cover every single thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to... Um, make it plain, right? In the clinical world, 
we have different diagnoses. And so um, the differentiations that uh, Sharice was talking about as it relates to the onset and the time limit of how long it lasts, all of those we have to take into consideration when we are looking at is this seasonal, you know, depression or is this, do you have, you know, a, an issue of, of actual depression? Um, and so perfect way to um, just kind of make it plain on how we as clinicians can really tell the difference as well. Perfect. And then um, what would you say, and I think you guys already have hit on it. Um, you know, with the different seasons changing. Um, but what are some other causes of seasonal depression um, that, you know, really has people going into these winter blues, if you will? Yeah, yeah. So one, I think that, I think it deserves mention that um, nature experiences seasonal depression, like nature loses its leaves, plants are going into hibernation. There's just certain, uh, there's a certain type of like resting that happens. And I think that we struggle with that reaction, our natural reaction to that. Um, so I, I definitely want to name that. But some of the things that kind of go into the seasonal depression is, um, like Sharice mentioned, there's less daylight. And with less daylight, um, it lowers our motivation. We have less vitamin D. Having less vitamin D impacts us and all the way around. Um, there's a different act. We don't really have a lot of knowledge about like, um, gen the general, the general population doesn't have a lot of knowledge about, um, seasonal foods. And so like the foods that bring us joy, the experiences around food that bring us joy, um, sometimes they're centered around outside, um, in warm weather and warm weather and communal spaces. And in the wintertime, we don't have as much access to it. Um, or, yeah, we don't have access to it in a way that it feels easier in other months if we are people who flourish in warmer and sunnier months. Um, also, because the daylight is, there's less sunlight, it's darker for longer and darkness symbolizes rest to us anyway, but we're not able to rest because it's four o'clock. Um, and maybe we're still at work and we still have to that go part. someplace. <laughs> so now we're having to contend with like, wow, this feels very late, um, but it's not late. And now what do I do with myself because it's so dark? Um, so those are, those are some of the things. And then just thinking about like holidays, like there's a lot of holidays that happen in the winter month. Um, and whether you are big into the holidays or not, you know, this is a time where people are getting together with their family. And so if you don't have family, if you don't have community, if you, we're in a global pandemic. So if you don't even have access to your family, now you're feeling a level of like isolation, um, or loneliness. And it's hard to cope with that. Um, in the ways in which we might have been able to better cope with it in earlier months. Um, yeah. That's perfect. And Sharice, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think that that's so great, um, especially the part about nature. But I was thinking about, you know, there are so many other things that are triggers just in the holiday season alone. If you think about being bombarded with, you know, advertisements and sales and Cyber Monday and Black Friday. And if you have limited financial resources and you already feel pressure to make certain things happen for your children, then it's like additional stress and anxiety just knowing that Christmas is coming and then there's the wrapping paper and I got to get a tree and it's just all this pressure um, to participate in the festivities. And then like if you're co-parenting and you you have to be without your child for a holiday because it's the other parent's holiday. And now you feel some loneliness around or even some grief around the separation of your family. You know, all of those things are coming up simultaneously on top of the fact that it's cold, it's dark, um, you know, and it's six o'clock and I am still at work, but I feel like it's midnight. <laughs> So all of those things combined are a recipe for sure for, um, you know, increased anxiety and seasonal depression. Yeah. And um, I was definitely doing some research as well, um, just about some of the causes. And one thing that I saw and I, I just put it in here 
like you you all were just saying, the reduced level of sunlight in the fall and winter months um, affects the individual serotonin, you know, that neurotransmitter that affects mood. And so lower levels of serotonin have been shown to be linked to depression, right? So when we think about just our biological makeup, <laughs> that's super important for us to know. Um, and then another um, fact that I found, um, the melatonin um, correlation, right, which is a sleep-related hormone, has also been linked to seasonal depression. Um, and this is a hormone that can affect sleep patterns and mood, you know, what we were just uh, speaking about, and it's produced at increased levels in the dark. And so knowing this, right, <laughs> And knowing that it gets darker earlier and we're in more dark times than light, that means the melatonin is, you know, just rapidly increasing within our bodies, um, you know, and really causing us to have this off balance. Um, you know, like you're saying, when you see, you know, it's dark outside, you want to sleep, but it's four o'clock, so you actually can't sleep. Um, and so it's like, what do you do in a sense, right? What, what do you do? And so it, it really speaks to the importance of um, making sure that you want understand and, and um, can identify seasonal depression and that you put things in place for um, seasonal depression to really help yourself. Um, and so, yeah. So next, and we definitely mentioned um, some of these, but what are some symptoms that people should look for to identify if they may be struggling with seasonal depression? Um, what, what, what would you say? I would definitely say change in mood, lack of energy, you know, decreased appetite, interrupted sleep patterns. You know, Christy, what you mentioned in terms of like, you know, it's four o'clock, five o'clock, you know, <laughs> this really happened to me the other day. I kind of dozed off. It was 530. Um, and, you know, somebody FaceTime me. It's like six o'clock. It's pitch black. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what time is it? I'm thinking it's like midnight. And it's like six o'clock, but in other instances, you may fall asleep at like six, but then you wake up at midnight and now you can't go back to sleep to like three or four o'clock, but now you got to be up at eight o'clock, you know, so it's like you're irritated, you're thrown off and all of these things are happening on top of just like normal everyday stress that's occurring, you know, no matter what the season is. So all of those things are happening. So now you're agitated, you're irritable, um, and so many other things. It's just like a ripple effect. Yeah. Um, and to add on to that, I love that you say agitation because um, a lot of people um, don't realize that being increasingly irritable um, is a big symptom associated with depression and anxiety. But um, just noting that you just have less patience for things, less patience for yourself. Um, everything's kind of getting on your nerves. Um, maybe you're even feeling overstimulated. Like maybe the sounds are too loud. The light is too bright. You know, like you're just, you can't have another conversation. Those types of things, especially if it's different from what you're, how you're used to experiencing yourself might be um, a sign and symptom. Another thing is um, not really having an interest in the things that you used to do or used to enjoy. Um, that's a big one. Um, knowing that you used to, I don't know, used to garden and now you haven't even thought about your plants in days, um, which can lead to guilt. Um, and also it's a it's a gap in like how we used to regulate. When we engage in the things that we used to enjoy, um, it was a way for us to regulate and feel connected and feel fulfilled. And so if we're not motivated to do those things, we're not even thinking about it. We also haven't actively replaced that either. Um, so now that's a big gap in our um, in our space. So um, yeah, I think that and the sleeping too much, sleeping too much, and experiencing insomnia. Um, and the last thing I wanted to add is, um, Christy, when you're talking about the melatonin, seasonal depression is also uh, really high in the community with people who experience chronic pain, mm -hmm. um, especially sickle cell. Um, some of the colder temperatures, colder cold water, um, it really impacts those flare-ups. Excuse me, it really impacts those flare-ups. And so it's harder to 
you know, keep your body temperature in a way that's going to um, keep that pain at bay. And being in constant, constant pain is depressing. Um, and then going outside hurts sometimes. And so that also can lower your motivation and, and, uh, and make you feel a little bit more hopeless or helpless. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that um, because you don't actually think about that um, un unless you're dealing with it, right? So you don't think that the people who may have certain illnesses, um, these months are worse for them, much worse for them, right? And so we definitely have to make sure that if we have any friends or family members who may have um, any of those uh, chronic pain type of illnesses, that we're really checking in with them um, and supporting them and seeing just what they need and how we can be of help during this time. That was definitely a good point. Um, I also found just statistics around the prevalence of seasonal depression. And so, and I got all of these facts from the Mental, uh, Mental Health of America. And so it says the prevalence of seasonal depression is anywhere from zero to 10% of the population. And, um, and that's depending on the geographic region. Um, and then the one that clearly hits me the most, <laughs> four out of five people who have seasonal depression are women. <laughs> I'm like, come on, what, you know, what is this? Why are we always the ones? <laughs> you know, who um, just experience things the most. And so what is your thought around that, right? That the prevalence really is in a women and, you know, we experience it at a higher rate than men. Um, how come you think that's the case? You know, I... I low key, I, I have my, I have, I have my speculations about that being the case, just because of how, just because of how depression presents um, across the gender spectrum. Um, I think that um, women are socialized to be more connected to um, their. I think that women are socialized to be of service to so many people all the time, so that we are maybe constantly checking in with our capacity or lack because we have to maybe take care of family or children or partners um, or friends. And so, or at work and we're doing more of the work load there. So I think that we're coming into contact with like, I don't got it. And there's some people who get to just storm out of the office, but for women, especially black women, like we can't even be irritable at work. Um, we can't be tired at work. We can't be exhausted at work. And I, so that's something that's, that's just like a little, it's a little, <laughs> You know, I have a point of, you know, I have a point of concern. But it, the other thing that I was thinking about is um, there's just a lot of pressure on women to look a certain way, to show up a certain type of way, to be of service to other people. And, you know, it. I don't know about you. Like, I like going for walks, but it's harder for me to go to walks, go on walks when it's cold outside. So now I'm thinking about, you know, I, am I packing on pounds? We have the internalized fat phobia all over the place. Um you know, the lack of motivation, finances is a thing for women too. Like there's not a lot of, well, I don't wanna say there's not a lot, but there's plenty of women who struggle with loneliness and finding partners and companionship. And so now they're feeling really lonely because now people are with their people um, during the holidays. And so I think there's a lot of factors that just weigh down on us, especially because the winter months is closer to the new year. And then we look at the new year, now we're setting our intentions and we're thinking about what we accomplished or not accomplished. Um, and the other thing I'll add is I think that as women, especially black women, we struggle with rest and we often don't have the opportunity to rest. We don't know how to rest, but we know we need to do it. And that's a really frustrating space to be in. Um, so yeah. The comments are lighting up. So I'm going to highlight some of them. Um, and Sharice, I know you want to chime in, but I'm going to highlight some of them. Uh, because they are just lighting it up. Tranisha says, I think it's our hormones. And I was going to say the same thing. I feel like because we already deal with so many different hormones, that, that definitely is a contributing factor. Um, and then some people are just agreeing, you know, bingo. Um, Madison says hormones scientifically based on chemical makeup as well. Um and then uh, Trinisha came back and she said our EQ, you know, when you were mentioning us constantly checking in with other people and making sure everyone else was OK. Um, 
and then check, of course, you know, needing to check in with ourselves. Um, so, so that was, and then we have a trying to maintain balance personally and professionally, um, which is a real thing. And then I'm not sure who this is, because it just says LinkedIn user, but they said you was hitting the nail right on the head with your comments and, and they were agreeing um, with everything. Um, we look, we have a lot of agreements. People are in agreements, the rest portion, <laughs> right? Um, and then we only tend to rest when we're sick, unfortunately. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, that's a real thing for a lot of women. Um, I was literally just speaking about that, right? About telling someone that, look, you have to, you know, make sure that you're resting. And, you know, people say, I, you know, I rest when I'm dead, but you're going to get there faster if you don't rest. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we are not playing into what society feels, you know, that we should be doing, right? Always on the go, always working, always doing the next big thing. Um, I, you know, clearly I struggle, struggle with that as well. And so making sure you are intentionally uh, resting. Um, and Latasha says, say no. Okay. No is a complete sentence. Period. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, everyone. I love um, seeing the comments. Um, Sharice, go ahead and add in. I mean, everything that was said, every comment, every period, pretty much just like summed it up. But I, I definitely just really want to double down on the notion that we as women um, tend to lack the ability to sit down and be still. And I think what's happening right now is a struggle in our bodies with what nature is telling us to do and what our normal way of functioning is telling us to do. So we're wrestling against both. Um, and I definitely think that's one of the reasons that I also think, you know, and this may be just according to how um, your household is set up, but very in various households, when you think about preparing the house for Christmas, that is also typically on, um, you know, the woman of the house to like do the decorations and wrap the gifts and buy the gifts and know what the kids want and the yeah. sizes. And it's, it's just a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. <laughs> so that is the reason why. And I feel like, you know, I mean, I hope I don't step on any masculine toes here. But I think that um, men have the ability to kind of throw their hands up a little bit better than we do, you know, to say, hey, I need a time out. I'm going to take a time out. Like, I'm not even about to get permission. Like, this is what I'm doing. Um, and I think that we can definitely uh, take a page out of their book <laughs> when it comes to that. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, this idea of gender roles for me, you know, they need to be reevaluated <laughs> because, look, you know, for for all of these years, you know, it's like the woman need to do this, the woman need to do that. And it's like, look, we tired. <laughs> you know, we don't feel like doing all of these different things. And I do think that that plays into why um, maybe women experience these different like depression and anxiety um, the most. Yes, those letting go of those gender um, norms, um, especially during this time. Right. And so any of our um, men that are listening in. We need more support, right? We need you to step in more <laughs> during this time of the year. Um, because in addition to just naturally dealing with the season change, it's all of these other uh, different things that we have to deal with. So men, let's definitely step it up. Help out the women in your lives, you know, whether it's your partner, your, your mom, your sibling, you know, whoever it is, a family member, um, because this time can be, can be very draining, stressful um, for a lot of people, but especially women. So yes, thank you so much for um, those comments. Michelle, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, in the holidays, if family is something that's important for people, 
um, a lot of people have experienced like loss and it's hard to celebrate some of these um, traditions and events without them. And so we also don't really know how to grieve either. So it's hard to be grieving and holding that weight while also holding everything else. Um, so, you know, I just, I definitely wanted to name the grief piece. It's hard to go through these, this time, this season when you don't have um, a, a loved one um, to call on, to care for, to lean into. Yeah, and, and I definitely wanted to make sure that we speak about that as well. Um, someone actually had put in our comments to make sure they asked us if we can make sure to just speak about grief and loss and how best um, people can deal with that during this time, right? Because even though you may be dealing with grief and loss throughout the year, this time is the worst part of the year for people. Why? Because this is considered family time. Right. It, it's just whether you celebrate or not, this is this is considered family time for people. And if you are missing someone or, you know, that is it was very important into your life, whether it's a sibling, a parent, a friend, this is a tough time for you. And so, you know, I guess what type of um, interventions in the sense, right? or types of things that people can do to help them um, through this time of, of that grief and loss. What are some of your suggestions for that? Um, I, well, I would definitely say, and I know I want to acknowledge that for a lot of people, this is the first time that they're going through a holiday season. So the loss is like super fresh um, in terms of you've never even experienced a major holiday without your loved one. Um, so that's just something to even um, consider on the front end, like how do I prepare for what I'm going to be feeling and experiencing around this? And I think that's just the most important part, just acknowledging that some potential feelings can come up and what can I do when that happens? Um, so I think definitely, um, obviously an advocate for therapy and people going to therapy, particularly around grief and loss, um, just to navigate and get personalized interventions based on their um, needs and their experience. Um, but also just having a support system and a network that you can reach out to and plug in with um, quickly. Um, having someone that knows your situation intimately and can be able to pick up the phone for you um, and support you, come to you if you are in need because grief has this way of showing up in ways like one minute you can be okay and then you could smell an apple pie and grandma used to make apple pie and you know now you're sad um but i think there's some opportunity in that too like as those things are happening just to know like okay this is a trigger for me so i need to prepare myself if i'm gonna be in a space with apple pie because i know apple pie is a trigger for me mm -hmm. and um unfortunately but fortunately we have to kind of navigate through the grief to understand what's even happening to develop a plan to support us. Um, so we can continue to navigate life through grief because it's a new part of what we're experiencing. Um, it's a new normal for us having to maneuver through life without um, a loved one. And then just really quickly, in addition to this, I tend to notice um, and pay attention to the fact that it's, it's seemingly so, at least in my experience, that a lot of people tend to transition around like October, November, December. So in addition to navigating your own grief, there's these transitions that are happening all around us that are now reminding us of our loss as we're um, being in close relationships with people around us who are having losses. So best friend, her mom dies. And then this friend, her sister, you know, so... Um, it really is impacted and it's important for us to have supports and resources around us. Yeah. Um, and just to piggyback, I think some people tend to um, go inward, right? Um, and they may not want to be bothered, um, you know, during, during times like this. Um, but community, right? The right community is extremely important for your mental health. And so, you know, just understanding that um, sometimes it's always um, not the best thing to be by yourself. Um, and even if you don't really want anyone to say much, 
having someone in your space that loves you, that supports you, that cares about you um, can really make a difference. And so just making sure that people do understand that, that it is not always best to, you know, just straight go inward and, and be alone per se, but really making sure that you are allowing your community, your um, family, you know, that you are close with your close knit friends to be there to support you. Um, Michelle, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I also wanted to add, and I wanted to respond to um, the comment that was there, but I do want to add, um, highlight that Sharice said that grief is a new normal. I think people think, oh, I just need to get over this. And it's like, no, this is like another part of our human experience, um, fortunately, unfortunately. And I think that the less we resist against that, the um, the more opportunities we have to um, like move through grief um, with a little bit more capacity and a little bit more, uh, like a little healthier. Um, so that's that's one thing. The other thing about grief is like we don't know how to we don't know what to do with it. Like we don't know how to we we are expected to do these things. But again, we don't know what the trigger is going to be. We don't know what's going to make us remember um, our loved one or our loss. And it's hard. And we don't often have the luxury to stop and have a crying spell in the middle of a whatever. And so um, just kind of I want to remind people to just extend yourself some grace like you're not weak. There's nothing wrong with you. Like grief is painful. Um, and, you know, it's something new that we are experiencing. And sometimes we don't even know what kind of help we need. And so just going back to what you all said, um, I recently, like, listen, this, this is the season, recently had um, an elder pass. And I my friend asked me what I needed. And I said, can I just come sit in a corner of your house? We don't have to interact. I just want to be in this space with somebody who I know loves me. You don't have to make sure I'm good. And I just want to be there. And she said, I'm going to pick you up after work. And that's and that's really all I need. Um, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's things like that. If you don't know what you need, um, you know, it's OK to figure it out. And for people who are caring for people who have grief, um, who are experiencing grief, who are experiencing loss, you may not know what to do. You may interact with them how you typically are interacted with. Um, and it really is no harm in asking, like, you know, how can I support you? Or just thinking like, you know, sometimes people can't cook for themselves. When we think about depression, one of the symptoms of the of grief can lead into depression. And so sometimes we don't have the energy to cook for ourselves or clean up or run these types of errands. And so maybe we can lean into our community um, in those ways. Um, but one of the, oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, I was gonna say one of the, uh, one of the comments said during this time I tend to shut down and not wanna be around anyone. I don't know why. Um, I'm guessing because I have so much going on, it's back to back and it drains me. Um, and I, I I really do appreciate this comment because as we're talking about seasonal depression, as we're talking about um, just like having a lower capacity on a biological level and then socially, um, it makes sense that you would shut down because your body is in conservation mode. Your body is literally trying to do everything it can to keep you alive because it is it's actually like emotionally and psychically dangerous, um, like big, scary, very dangerous to not have the energy to do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself or to not be able to show up in the ways that people are expecting you to. Um, your livelihood depends on it. Your family relationships, your your spot and community depends on it. Um, and it's, it's scary to think that you can't show up the way you need to show up or the way you're expected to show up. Um, and it's also scary to think I can't get myself what I need. Um, and so it makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense that you will feel stuck. You will feel shut down. Um, so I just want to normalize that for you. And also, you know, we can't go from feeling shut down to feeling bubbly and social and charismatic. You know, we have to take it like one step at a time. And so kind of giving yourself the chance to feel, you know, like if you're shut down level 10, give yourself some grace if you're feeling shut down level nine tomorrow. Um, that's still progress. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I got word that that LinkedIn user was Lakia Omo. And then we had another one that said LinkedIn user earlier, and that was from Ray B. So just want to acknowledge um, the people who are um, putting in their comments. And I mean, we can go on and on and talk about, right, grief and loss and how um, it really is different for everyone. Right. And we have to think of 
of grief and then the grieving process as really this continuum, right? When we talk about it clinically, is no, you know, real way because you can experience the different um, steps of, of grief in, in different spaces and different places and times. And so like Michelle was saying, you have to just give yourself that grace um, and understand that you are human. <laughs> we have a roller coaster of emotions. We are not certain when we will be triggered, um, but you may be triggered at any time when you don't, when you least expect it. Um, and that's okay. Um, and it's normal. It's completely normal. And during this time, a lot of people are triggered um, just because of the season that we're in. Um, such a great conversation. Um, a lot of people were in the comments. We appreciate your comments. So I wanted to um, talk briefly about seasonal affective disorder, right? Or SAD. Um, are they interchangeable? seasonal depression, and then some people know it as sad, right? Would you say that these are interchangeable or is there a slight difference between the two? I would characterize them to be interchangeable, but I think if you can peel back the layers a little more, there are some um, different characterizations. Um and I think it's a part, the part of throwing, putting the holidays, um, the holidays into the season as well. Um, but I, I spent some time doing some research myself because I've noticed in the research that it's used interchangeably. Yep. Um, a lot of the researchers are, are saying sad or they're saying um, seasonal depression. So I think it really just depends. But I'm interested to hear, Michelle, what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I, I I too have seen it. Uh, I I've seen seasonal depression used a lot more lately than seasonal affective disorder, and I'm wondering if seasonal depression feels like less diagnosy. Um, um, but one of the things that I have I still have a point of research, and I definitely want to circle back and get back to you all. Um, but highlighting the holiday season, if we're having seasonal depression, we can experience that in any season. Um, but seasonal affective disorder, um, a lot of research specifically speaks to it in the colder winter months. Um, and so they feel interchangeably. I understand why they're used interchangeably. And I also wonder if seasonal affective disorder is chronic. Like if that's like if somebody experiences it every single season, um, cause some seasons may be better than others, you know, like this, this fall was a little warm for us. Um, I know for a fact that I thought I was a, a seasonal affective disorder shorty, but I actually been pretty good this winter. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. It. And if it is just a holiday thing or if it is, you know, like new habits and new, uh, new environments that's kind of impacting that experience. Yeah, I would agree. Um, when I was doing the research, a lot of what I was reading, um, they were using it interchangeably as well. Um, but when looking, I guess, really at DSM, you know, doing the clinical background. Um, like you mentioned, Michelle, is the chronic piece um, for the um, seasonal affective disorder to kind of differentiate the two. Um, and so, but I wanted us to make sure that we speak about that because people hear about SAD um, and use the, you know, SAD, but is it really you know, seasonal depression um, in a sense. So definitely can be used interchangeably, but I think it's like you said, Michelle, it's that chronic piece of um, of the depression that will have someone be diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder um, and then just, I mean, depression and just have kind of, you know, be going through seasonal um, depression, which we also kind of call the winter blues. But like Michelle said, you can have it for any kind of changing of the seasons. So that was a good point as well. Someone put in a comment and I'll um, just, we can just touch on it really quickly. 
how is grief the new normal? Um, they said, what does that mean long term? Yeah, so um, what we mean by it's the new normal is like grief is not something that stops by and goes away, right? Um, grief is not like a knee injury that you heal and then you don't really have to interact with it. You know, that's not how my injuries work. Grief is something that we are, we grow capacity around. It impacts us for the rest of our life. Some moments are better than others. Um, we lose um, many people, many identities, many places that were safe for us. Um, so we're constantly um, on this journey of losing what we thought was going to be forever or our thing or what we knew to be true. Um, and so that's what we mean by it's the new normal. You know, now we have, when we experience a major loss of any kind, um, we now have a part of our emotional makeup, the potential to be sad, angry, in denial, um, frustrated, overwhelmed, um, and feeling a little bit hopeless, uh, you know, for whatever stretch of time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that grief is also not around um, just specifically people. It can be around um, experiences or lack thereof. Um, so it could be grieving a, a broken family, um, grieving a relationship with a parent. It may not be that parent has transitioned, but the relationship is broken to the point that it cannot be repaired. And there is grief around that. Um, you know, I think about us navigating through COVID and the grief around like not having to have a baby shower. When you think back, like around your pregnancy, you weren't able to have a baby shower. You weren't able to have a graduation when you got your master's degree. Like we are now kind of grieving what that felt like. I am even thinking about Christmas. Last Christmas, my whole family had COVID and we weren't able to gather and there was some grief around that, but now there's some anxiety around this year. So it's a constant back and forth between um, the grief and the depression and the anxiety triggers and like a diamond or a triangle of sorts. Definitely. Um, and then I was told that that question was from Ray B again. Uh, so thank you for your question. Um, so we're going to go into you know, we spoke about a lot of different things, but what can people do throughout this time, right? What are some of the interventions that they can do to help combat seasonal depression? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, this is my favorite. I'm like, because I, I really had to like come up with a plan for myself, but also help others um, just to really get through. Because I'm thinking like if we in November and we I'm this is the experience, what is it going to look like around February? OK, <laughs> I'm going to be the winter blues to be that took me out by February. So um, a part of it is planning for what is that going to look like for me in January and February? Like I need to plan some warm weather travel for January and February because I know at that point I will have reached my capacity for the cold. Um, but in addition to that, I try to just kind of um, what I like to call like luxuriate and just really spend time like with body scrubs and exfoliators and body butters and things that have certain scents to it. So like I'm benefiting from the aromatherapy, I'm benefiting from the self-massage and the skincare. Um, and I'm just doing a ritual for myself, to myself, by myself that feels good to me. Um, that just kind of just helps to like boost my mood. Um, also like light therapy is super helpful as well. Um, I've invested in like some Himalayan um, rock salt lamps, but also like particular light um, therapy light bulbs that are available on Amazon. Um, so yeah, those are a few things that I love to do. And then also forcing myself, even if the temperature is not ideal, if it's a sunny day, just taking a peek, getting a peek out, um, you know, for a few moments, even if it's just to sit, you know, put my, my sunroof open when I'm driving so I can get some sun in. Those are all things that are super duper helpful. Uh, for just maintaining a daily routine that um, acknowledges the fact that it's difficult to navigate around this season. Yeah. Um, 
this I, this is my favorite part too, Sharice. You already you hit you hit my favorites. Light therapy is like even if you can't get outside, sometimes I like there's the sun comes into my house a certain way. So I'll stand in the door or the window and just let the sun beam on me from the warmth of my home, but getting the sunshine on me and like just really taking one minute. You got 60 seconds to give yourself some sunlight. And so it's going to be important to like really prioritize that. Um, the other thing is movement. I know we struggle um, with movement and um, I'm not saying you got to join a CrossFit gym, but it it really, I started to actually follow this protocol myself. I like actually started like moving my body in. I, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. It really does work. When you talk about like the lower serotonin levels, um, moving your body boosts, boosts something in your body called endorphins. Endorphins feel good um, in your body. And so even if you do a little dance, a little jake, a little shake, um, you take a little walk, whatever you have to do, if you start baking something and you have to need something like get your body moving because you're going to increase your likelihood of your body being able to produce endorphins, which help you feel a little bit more energetic, make you feel a little bit more connected. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm, I'm a tea girl. I love tea. I love supplements. And I'm, and I think that mother nature really has, has, has a lot in store for us. And so, you know, if we know we're going to get less sun, less sunlight, less opportunities to be outside and fresh air, then we might want to up our supplements and things that help our respiratory health, things that help us increase our vitamin D levels, um, things that help us balance our hormones. Um, and in addition to those supplements, I don't know uh, how familiar you all are with it, but please incorporate a probiotic into your diet. Like gut health is a real big thing. Like we have our mind and our emotions, but it's also in our gut. And being able to create an environment where our, where our gut can do what it got to do really is critical in impacting and improving our mood. Um, and then I know that we talk about community and I work with people who struggle to maintain or who, who are younger. So they're trying to establish community. Um, and so I, I want us to let's lean into our gift of social media. Um, and, you know, just, you know, find the people that like the things you like. Okay, find the people who like the things you like, because even a brief interaction about the things you like could really help you feel more connected and less isolated um, during these times. You guys had all of the different, <laughs> um, you know, interventions that I um, was thinking about, that I read about. Um, exercising is so important. You know, people don't realize how your gut is interconnected with everything. Um, and so making sure that you are eating foods that lift you up and not bring you down is important. Um, so, you know, if you have to do some research around different things, do that research and figure that out um, because that's going to be more helpful for you during this time. All right. So um, we have a comment. This is so helpful. So many of us were taught to get over whatever caused you know, who caused the grief. So thank you. I'm glad this was helpful. Um, and we're living in a different time where we are <laughs> trying to do things differently. Um, you know, everything that we were taught may not have been the quite the right way to deal with things. And so we are really relearning how to manage, how to go about um, and how to deal with things, you know, like grief and loss. Um, and so I'm really glad that we were able to provide um, some interventions and different things for you all today. We have one more question that we are going to uh, speak about because I definitely think that's important as well. And so the last question that we have is how can employers help their employees who may be struggling with seasonal depression. Um, you know, we at SMILE are really trying to make sure that corporations and organizations fully understand their role in mental health and making sure that their employees' um, mental health is at, you know, a higher level capacity. And so what do you think that some employers can do to really help their employees during this time? I love this. I love this. Um, you know, I 
one of the things that employers can do around this time is to kind of take into stock that we're in cold and flu season. Seasonal depression is a thing that can impact people. Um, and so, you know, to have some compassion and empathy for the employees and staff who are saying that they are tired or who are a little bit overwhelmed or who are approaching deadlines and might need a little bit of help or assistance. Um, I think that having that grace, because a lot of people, I mean, I just had a client who had COVID, then had the flu, then had food poisoning. And they're like, well, I don't, I can't tell my boss I'm sick again. They won't believe me. I'm like, so sad. Yeah. You know, so it's just like, I know that we have a job to get done. I know we have quotas that have to be met. Um, but also like your employees are humans and like, let's really create a space for them to have these very real experiences, especially around this time. Um, we can't help it if we get sick, especially if we have small children in our life. I mean, like we, we really can't. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, like let's, can we build in days or times during the day for your employees to uh, like recharge, reset, be poured into? Can we up the affirmation or the support or the reflection of what is working during this time? I know it's the end of the year and we tired and we got these quotas to meet all this other stuff, but these people are tired too and they're working as hard as they can, despite all the things that we just named earlier. So, you know, what does it look like to, in these check-ins, can we get can we get back to the sandwich method? Can we start with a positive, give some feedback and then end with a positive? Um, can we take care of ourselves as leaders of these organizations so that we're not punching down on our employees? Um, because, you know, like the leaders of the organization are not the only ones who get to be human. The, you better drop the mic on that. <laughs> And Sharice, I know you want to add. Come on. <laughs> that was definitely a mic drop. <laughs> that was good. We need to put that on a t shirt. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I, I think you said everything. And I think it's just about being mindful that employees are having these experiences. And then also, um, I think it would be even better to take a look at just the year and think about the employees who experienced transition, those employees that took bereavement leave um, last year, the year before, and do a special um, check-in with those um, individuals to see how they're doing. Also, just having a standardized, like, a safe space, a grief and loss session, sending reminders out about what is available within the EAP program. Um, and obviously, you know, bringing in companies like Smile to support the efforts that you all have um, at your organizations and allowing us to be the clinical experts that we are um, to provide those interventions and give people support and you know get them along on their healing journey yes um i love all of those different things i think it is so important um i mean but the, really the main thing is just to be mindful um of the time of the year be mindful of what may be going on with your employees um you know and and give some compassion during this time um, give some days off. We are a big proponent of mental health days. So make sure you have those for them. Um, so all of those things are truly important. Um, and just knowing that mental health is super important and it's not just a personal thing. It is definitely a professional thing as well. This was such a great conversation. Um, even though technology was trying to get us earlier, we, um, you know, I hope that everyone really took something from this conversation. I'm not sure if you all have any more questions, but I try to make sure we answer the questions as we went along. If you do have any other questions, just go ahead and drop them in. Um, we will be looking at the comments even after we get off of here. And we'll be responding to you all. Thank everyone for joining us today. We definitely had a good group. Comments was on fire. Um, thank you, Sharice. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, such great information. Um, such great interventions. Um, let's put those interventions into play so that we can effectively deal with this season. Um, reach out to any one of us if you need some support. Um, Michelle, as she stated, she has her own company, Therapy to a T Co. 
<laughs> I think I'm saying that right. Um, you know, reach out to her, reach out to us. Um, if you need any support in any way, uh, we're definitely here to support you. Uh, if you are a corporation and you are looking for support for your employees, uh, reach out to Smile Therapy Services. Uh, we are definitely here to support. Thank you all. Um, thank you. I see uh, awesome presentation, ladies. Great information. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you all um, for being here. And this is the last time you'll see us for a little bit <laughs> into the new year. So have a great um, rest of December because you might as well say we're in December already. Um, be safe. Please have a great new year. We are going to come back at you during the new year uh, with some fresh, bright topics um, that I'm sure everyone will be interested in. And so we just thank you. I appreciate you. And until next time, we will see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.